So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Business as Usual. Today we have a very special event and partnership that I'm going to talk about. I'm Audrey. I run the Pittsburgh Tech Council and thrilled to be here with Jonathan Kirsting. He's vice president of all things media, and uh, he makes sure that we're telling stories and doing all the things of shining the light on Pittsburgh. He'll be moderating the chat and uh, making sure that we're not overlooking anything. So I want to give a shout out to Huntington Bank. They've been our partners right from the onset. And uh, from the onset, meaning we've been doing this since March and we are now in December. And we took a few days off, but now we're back and we're pretty excited about today's program and about the partnership. I also want to give a deep appreciation to the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. It's the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. If you don't know anything about them, I just want to set the stage a little bit because I think it's important. They have three arms of, and they're operating arms. They have the Pittsburgh Regional Health Initiative that they refer to as PRHI. They have Health Careers Futures, which they call HSHCF, and the Women's Health Activist Movement Global and that's WHAM Global. We'll put the links out there so you can, you can um, you know, go through them and see the kind of work that they're doing because it's a lot. They offer what um, they like to refer to as a unique brand of activist philanthropy to advance healthcare innovation, advocacy, collaboration, and education in the interest of better population health. They have been our partners and in many different ways over the last few months and as issues that we've grappled with as a region. They've given us advice and perspective on matters that are tied to COVID as well as um, issues that are tied to safety. And I think if you go to their website, you'll get a rich understanding about all the things that they work on and the innovations that they have. So they are their partner and sponsor today and also 40 by 80. That's our nonprofit entity of the Tech Council that's leading many of our efforts that are tied to entrepreneurship as well as um, workforce and talent development across our region. So we have muted your microphones. We don't want to hear what's going on in the background. And uh, but we have a chat, as I mentioned earlier. So please use this opportunity to ask questions. You're gonna be really impressed with Elizabeth, who's gonna join us in a minute. So I know there's gonna be lots of questions. And this is not an opportunity for you to sell your wares and for any kind of advertisements. That's not what today is about. We do that in other days. Today, when we do this work, we don't. So I mentioned this as a, as a joint program with the, the team at Liftoff PGH. And I, and I wanna to bring to the forefront, Megan Butler, from that team. She's going to tell you about the program and then she's going to do a quick intro to Elizabeth. And, and Elizabeth has, has a lovely title and I'm not going to script it because I want Megan to <laughs> actually do the intro. So Megan, please introduce yourself. Thank you so much for being such a great partner and uh, you know pushing the agenda of all the matters. And we're very lucky to have our guest today. So Megan, welcome. Thank you, Audrey, for that lovely introduction. Like Audrey said, I'm Megan Butler, and I'm an innovation associate with the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, working on Liftoff PGH 2020. And we are so excited to be partnering with the Pittsburgh Technology Council and business as usual on today's session. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of Liftoff PGH, we are a two week long virtual summit that actually kicked off officially just yesterday. So we're really excited. We have programming happening on a daily basis leading up to December 15th and 16th. Those two days are going to be full day live broadcasts, but leading up to those days, we have bits of programming going on on a daily basis. The goal of the virtual summit is to help prepare the Pittsburgh region for the future of healthcare innovation. So it's a very regional initiative really focused on how we can leverage our assets here to position the region to be as strong as it can be in the future. So we hope that some of you will consider joining us. I see that Alexis posted the link to our website in the chat. So we hope that you take a look at our website to learn a little bit more. And if you're interested, registration is still open, even though we did officially launch yesterday. So anybody who's interested in registering can do so using the link in the chat. Um, so we're really excited for today's session. We actually started our partnership with the Tech Council over the summer on this um, series of webinars called Generation Fempreneur. So we're really excited to have um, 
our encore session of Generation Fempreneur today with Dr. Elizabeth Lane. And we have another Generation Fempreneur session next week on Wednesday as well. So we hope that you'll join us for that as well. Um, but with that, I'm really excited to introduce our guest for today, Dr. Elizabeth Wayne from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, Elizabeth is an assistant professor of biomedical engineering and chemical engineering at CMU, and her work focuses on immunotherapies, immunoengineering, and how um, that can be used to fight specific disease states, including cancer and COVID-19. So we're really excited to hear a little bit more about that today. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Elizabeth Wayne, would you like me to call you Dr. Wayne, Elizabeth? I, I think you can call me Elizabeth, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so wonderful to just meet you for a few minutes before, and I'm very, very call excited. Call me Liz, call me Liz. Liz, call you Liz, okay. So thank you, Liz, for joining us. So could you please just set the stage so everyone understands so who you are? That was a lovely introduction in, in terms of your work, but you know how long you've been in Pittsburgh, what your passion is, and then we're gonna jump into some questions. Wonderful, well, it's so great to uh, electronically meet all of you guys. I'm very excited to be in Pittsburgh. I have been here since August, 2019. Yesterday was my first real snow that I'm counting last year because that <laughs> whatever fell on the ground last year didn't count. I think you guys know this. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I'm originally from Mississippi. And so I always find this interesting to kind of start off with. Many people have never met someone from Mississippi and I don't have a Southern accent. No. Um, it kind of comes when I get back with my family. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, Mississippi is a great place and I, and I really appreciate my upbringing there. Um, so passions, uh, yeah. lifelong nerd. I think lots of things are interesting. I love following the interesting questions. And um, I have, I studied physics in undergrad and then I went to biomedical engineering and then I did a postdoc in pharmacy. So it makes perfect sense that I'm like a professor of biomedical and chemical engineering right now, right? Like that was a perfectly linear leap. Yeah. Um, but I fell in love with physics. I thought it was a great way to understand the world around me that physics was the physical, understand the physical world around me. And then math was the language of physics. So the map of the physical world. Yeah. So I, lifelong nerd, I told you that. Yeah. You uh, and then I started using that to do imaging. And I really became interested in how do we use physics principles? Like how does light travel through material to then understand um, how to make images of your body? And then that led to, well, now that I know how to make microscopes, how can I image this? And I became interested in cancer and trying to track your immune cells as um, they track cancer. Um, so what thing that's interesting about this is that can in cancer, 90% um, of cancer deaths are related to the spread of cancer. So if you can stop that spread, maybe you can stop, uh, slow down cancer. And then I thought, well, your immune cells are on, already in your body. They should really know what's happening because how do they determine when a cancer cell is um, there and how they recognize it and do they try to kill it? And then how can you develop drugs around that? And then that led into even more research and a collaboration uh, working on using uh, immune cells is what I would call Uber drivers. Like you can put the drug on the cell and then the cell just goes around and does whatever it's gonna do. Um, and now you just kind of give it a superhero cape. So it would kind of be like whether you're using your own GPS and walking around New York City or whether you trust that taxi driver that knows like how to get from 56 to 40 if in like two minutes because they know all the back ways. Your immune cells are those cells. And so once I started seeing the real utility of how immune cells can migrate through your body, they know where everything is, they have their own friend networks, they know how to communicate, they can go on road in the bloodstream, they can go off road in your lymphatic vessels, they just know the terrain super well. And then I thought, well, how do you actually try to use materials that can modulate them? What if you, instead of just saying that um, you want to put the drug on the, on the cell, but then let the cell do what it normally would do to then say something more active of, I want that nanoparticle or that drug to actually change something about the function. Not too sure about the NYC drugs. I, <laughs> I want to change something about the function of, the, of that cell. So then it does something that we actually wanted to do as in what if we can actually make nanoparticles that say, no cell, I want you to now go to the lung or I want you to stay away from the lung or, when you get there, I want you to be to have more uh, killing activity, or I want you to be more proliferative. 
And that is kind of the beauty of amino engineering, which is that you're now trying to introduce all these principles of engineering that we've got from chemical, material science, mechanical engineering, and saying, how do we apply that to immunology? So here you are, you, you're at Carnegie Mellon. You decide that you're gonna come way up north <laughs> and you know we love having you here just by listening to your preamble there. I'm, yeah. I'm thrilled. But in June, it's mm -hmm. not a but. And in June, yes. <laughs> you were awarded an NSF grant to apply your research in immunoengineering to the COVID pandemic. Yes. So give us an update. And how did yes. that happen? And you know, what are you doing? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, well, you know, I think this is a real entrepreneur-like question. So one, I, this is a precursor. I'm not quite sure what if people know what professors do. In a way, we actually are CEOs of a small startup company. Um, and what I mean by that is I pay a part of my own salary. I pay my students' tuition and salary and stipend. I have to apply for grants to get funding. And so you're always looking for figuring out like what type of space do I have? What skills, expertise do I have? And who needs that expertise? Mm -hmm. How can I apply them? And you're always also thinking, how do I uh, re-innovate myself? How do I um, adapt what I have to the current challenge? And so in that case, this became a question of COVID. So I told you about my interest in, macro, in uh, immune cells. My favorite one is the macrophage uh, because they, the, um, and my friend analogy, they're the, they're the type of immune cell that they do what the friend group does. So they kind of like, they're like your calm friend where they're like, okay, don't get mad at Jen. She just has this thing she wants to do, you know, and you know, you have to understand Steve, he just doesn't want to go out. Let's just help each other out. Which means that you can really tailor their responses based on what they see in their environment. And so if you artificially create something in their environment, then you can say, you can make them sway one way or the other. So these cells are also interesting because every, um, organ in your body has their own specialized type of macrophage. And by the way, macrophage is Greek for big eater. Um, they actually like to phagocytose things. They like to eat things. So when you have an injury, they either want to eat up all the dead cells, but they also convert to become wound healing that promotes angiogenesis. So new ah. vessel growth. So again, they have the ability to switch between one phenotype and another, which makes them really exciting for me. Now in COVID, um, what happens is that if you do aut autopsies from patients who succumb to COVID, they're filled with macrophages and monocytes. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought this is interesting. So what's happening? And there's also this connection. Um, if we go back to the friend analogy and the macrophages are the people who can be either uh, pro-activity or pro-relaxing, I, I will call them these two phenotypes. What happens, think about what happens when your basic friend, the one who's kind of agreeable, is no longer in the friend group. It's complete chaos because no one's trying to agree with each other, no one's talking, and the whole friend group eventually dissolves. And that is actually what happens in your organs and during disease. So if you were to look at cancer, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, diabetes, and even in wound healing, the inability for your body to heal after a heart attack or a stroke, those macrophages are not in their right phenotype. They're not behaving properly. And the same thing is happening for COVID. And so in patients that have that pre-existing conditions like diabetes, their monocytes and their macrophages are not behaving properly anymore. They don't, they don't really go with the flow of their friend group anymore. They're overreacting to things or they're underreacting to things and they're just letting everything get out of control. So when macrophages, macrophages are exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus and they're already not behaving properly, they have an overreactive response, which means they actually take everybody to the lung and they secrete more cytokines that are toxic that make other toxic things happen. And so instead of saying, oh wait, I should actually um, support my calm friend to promote suppression, they end up supporting the friend that's super active and always wants to go out all the time. And then before you know it, you have no more money. It's like the hangover, there's a tiger in your bathroom and you're like, what is happening? And that is what's happening in the lungs because of COVID. So now thinking about what the monocytes do, 
it becomes important to now think, well, how can we apply any immunoengineering principles to think about how we can kind of control that response? And that was what I was awarded this um, NSF grant to do. Um, two things. The first was to actually confirm that um, we don't quite understand why people who have pre-existing conditions have worse uh, mortality or they have worse symptoms from COVID. And I think it's the macrophages. So we're looking at that. And then the immunoengineering question for me becomes, well, now that we know this, how does that change any therapeutic pursuits that they have? So if the macrophages are not responding correctly to normal responses, and I guess the, the um, if I were to give an analogy here, your immune system is supposed to respond to things that are out of place, that are out of order. And I would think of this as um, if you and a friend are walking down the street and you see a puppy, or maybe it's a baby for some people, it's a baby for me currently, I'm in baby fever right now, um, <laughs> or it's like a sale at Costco or something, I don't know. Okay. A normal person would say, oh, there's a sale, that's nice, and they'll just keep walking, okay? An overreactive response would be for someone to literally go touch someone's baby, to just like have this dog lick their face and just like they don't know how to walk away. <laughs> okay, so the question is, how do we actually build materials or responses that can actually get that macrophage that's having an overreactive response to walk away? To walk away from the sale or the dog or the baby before they've committed any crimes. Wow. <laughs> So you're doing this research. How long is this NSF grant for? So the grant that I won is a, called a RAPID, and these are actually released under special circumstances. Um, so whenever there's some sort of uh, major national crisis, the NSF will put out emergency uh, uh, funds. Okay. And as plus they want you to do things rather quickly. So this grant will last one year. And then I will follow up and give the report. So the results, what I hope to show, and we're kind of halfway there, uh, is to show that when the monocytes are impacted, um, they have worse prognosis. Um, and to also relate this to antibody production, there's another question about whether people are generating the appropriate antibodies. And so along the same lines, if your immune system is not performing correctly, if they're having this irregular re overreactive response, it messes up every response that you have whether it's overproducing those cytokines, whether it's not producing the right type of antibodies, and it can have long lasting implications. So there's a biological standpoint I'm trying to understand, but the other thing is also, um, can we design drugs that specifically target macrophages that are diseased? Right. Um, so the yeah. analogy, if we go back to that dog analogy, right. um, if you wanna get a normal person not to pay attention to a dog, they already weren't paying attention to it. You probably don't have to do that much to, to the situation to make that normal person keep walking, right? Whereas if you gave that normal response to the overactive person, they would probably just walk right past it, right? You would need like a bigger blinder, maybe a, a, a larger dog, I don't know. You would need something else. And so that something else is the kind of biomaterials question I'm, I'm trying to answer. Um, how are the uptake pathways different? How are the activation different? And how can you uh, reverse engineer materials that can, can, that can be targeted specifically to these drugs or to these um, immune cells? Wow, so thank you so much. I love your analogies and I'm never gonna be the same when I walk down the street. So I'm always gonna well, be thinking about this. So thank you. I mean, you can always stop for the sale for the I dogs. Stop for the, for, I stopped for the dogs, the puppies and the sales. Yeah. So listen, you have been very vocal in the role of education in providing opportunities from people in, in, you know, in backgrounds that haven't had access. Can you tell us more about your own role in, in early childhood or in education, that sort of uh, how it affected your own career path? Yeah, and my mom is a school teacher. Um, and um, so one, I think I've always had this appreciation for how hard they work for how little they get compensated for that work. Um, <laughs> it's a very difficult job. Um, I also had the experience of going to several different schools within Mississippi. So I um, started elementary school at a school that was actually on probation. Um, and really, it wasn't very good. Wow. <laughs> and then 25 miles away, there was a school that was just like, people were doing much better. Um, and 
I really got to see what a difference geography made to the type of education people received. Right. Um, it, that was really cemented to me. And it was also kind of something of learning about what um, so socioeconomic status, race, gender, really play into these types of perceptions. Um, for whatever random reason, I wanted to be a physicist when I was 11. Uh, there was this chapter on atoms and I'd never heard of an atom before. You know, we had talked about the sun and the moon, like, okay, that's cool. Yeah, there's like nine. Okay, there, there were nine planets. Yeah. And now there's eight planets in a satellite. But at the time I thought like atoms are so cool. And then there was this chapter about, and if you like push the atoms together, like fusion, they release energy. And then if you also um, split atoms, then you also release energy. And by the way, those are the atomic bombs that hold, change our whole world as we know it today. So I was super excited about that. And when I was in sixth grade, I decided to do a science fair project. And then I decided to do it on nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty stupid what I think about it. I was like, I'm not doing a hurricane. I'm not doing like, a, like the volcano thing. That's just boring. That's like, that's overdone. I'm not doing a barometer. I did that last year. I'm gonna like literally try to build a, I'm gonna build a makeup reactor. Cause I was like, this costs millions of dollars. I don't have that kind of access. So in like early 2000, I was literally Googling like, where's the uranium 235? And like, how do you find these things in the library internet? Cause we didn't have internet yet. Uh, so yeah, I have really grateful I didn't try to do that, that now. I really think that I would have been arrested <laughs> for the types of things I was searching. Um, but I love science, I love physics, and I kept saying, I wanna be a physicist. And uh, we didn't have physics at my, my school. And we didn't really have like good math at my school. We didn't go all the way up to like AP calculus and, and things like that. And so I really got a great opportunity when um, I went to the Mississippi School for Math and Science. There are 14 states in the country that have these residential public math and science schools. Right. And I applied my sophomore year and I got in and really what made the difference for me was like they had the course catalog had like four physics classes. And I was like, well, if I'm gonna figure out if I could be a physicist, I have to like take a physics class. I have to, because I've read all I can in my, in the library books and stuff. And my internet searching is starting to, you know, lead to not looking up <laughs> physics things. Um, so um, I did that. I got really great experience with physics and um, still loved it. So then I went to school and I did that. So I guess the whole, I knew I wanted to do something. I think I'm kind of, um, naivety is good because when you don't know how hard something's gonna be, you don't stop yourself from trying to do it. Yeah. And so I'm grateful that I, was, I had this naivety and I'm grateful that I also kind of had a, a little bit of like hard headedness because people would always tell me like, but do you know what, oh, you're good at math and science? You're, you're a girl, like that's interesting. Or like um, being the only black person in my class. Like uh, it was really challenging to hear people kind of express these doubts, but then I kind of treated it like an experiment. Well, like, but what day do you have to support that claim? Absolutely none. So I'm just gonna keep doing this thing to figure out whether I wanna do it or not. Um, in undergrad, I was the only black person and I was only a woman in my classes uh, all four years. At uh, I was at Penn. I went to uh, Penn for um, undergrad. Uh -huh. And so, uh, yeah, that was interesting. Um, but I think, and I think if you guys are any, if there are any science people in the room, yeah. I think, you know, there's kind of a science culture of nerdiness, which like I related to very much. Um, it's just that like, I guess what I would say is we sort of sometimes glorify um, I don't know, the guy who kind of wakes up with bed hair and like runs to class and it's like really disorganized, but they have the glasses and it looks super smart. And I was like, well, what does it look like when it's a woman, right? If, what is it, and then what does it look when it's a black woman, right? right? So there's so many different layers to like, what does like crazy genius like really likes like anime or whatever the things are that, you know, you think nerds kind of culture is or like is reading about Feynman or like doing like, chess puzzles and stuff. So I think that having this representation I, it matters. It does. It, it really matters. And yeah. actually thinking about the intersections um, of, of power here. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, your candor is, is just delightful. 
I love the way that you break it down for, for all of us across the array of, of science and technology. You have also put together a podcast and a podcast called PH Divas. Yeah, that's fine. And, and talk about that. Just talk about that and then yeah. just tell us what the link is and we can, and we can share can it. Uh, so you can find PH Divas podcast on iTunes. I don't think we put it on Spotify, but we can do that. PH Divas WordPress, it's on SoundCloud. Like if you Google PH Divas podcast, you'll see it. it. Uh, my co-host and I started this when we were graduate students at Cornell. Uh, and what I find fascinating about it is it's a uh, two women of color. So the other host is, uh, an Asian woman. She's a uh, British, she's Canadian. Um, and she has a PhD in English and she's now actually, a, uh, the equivalent of a professor, uh, at University College of London. So what's funny about it is that when she was growing up, um, and she was like the top English person in her English class and people would tell her, but do you speak English? And she's like, yeah, I speak English. And actually like, I'm the best person in this class. And I'd be like, oh my God, I used to tutor my Asian friends in math. This is so cool, like reverse the, yeah. Um, so it's like, so we were both good at things that people didn't expect us uh, stereotypically to be good at, um, but we talk a lot. So what we do with the podcast now um, is that we try to amplify uh, voices of women in higher education. And it's really broad. It's whoever's pursuing higher education. So some people have degrees, some people don't. Mm -hmm. um, PhD, master's, it just kind of spans the gamut. And um, this was really just a conversation with a friend and we just kind of talked. Again, we started this as grad students and now we're both faculty. So it's just kind of wild to think about. And um, what it has become, I think is a really great opportunity to provide exposure. So uh, this idea that women are not often represented as experts in media is probably not new to any of you. Um, that the people who get called on to be experts are often not women of any ethnicity. Um, and I think having, I started to notice when we interviewed people that they were nervous, that they were like, oh, I'm not an expert. I'm like, I'm sorry, what are you studying? And then they go, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, I think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I think you can talk about this. Like, you know, X, this like, it's really, really mundane receptor in this really, really complicated disease. Or like you study 19th century literature about Arkansas or like someone, you actually study uh, Confederate statues. You study uh, migration. You, you know what you're talking about. And I think giving people that opportunity to, have a platform to share their knowledge, which literally leads to other people finding out about their work and giving them that taste of like right. um, a safe platform to, you know, understand they're actually experts. Well, yeah. that that was essentially going to be the question that I was going to lead into is sort okay. of what is your advice? And I think you cr have created some contagion there in, in all of your models. So here you are in Pittsburgh. And we in the, across the tech community want to figure out ways to get better, get wiser and support your work and people that are leading your kind of work. What's your advice? What do you, what do you want to ask of us? You've been here a year. Um, what do you want to ask of us and what, is there anything about Pittsburgh that has surprised you? Ooh, that's like three questions. I know, I always do that. <laughs> I like to pack it right in. Pack it right in. Um, the first thing about asking what can about what can be done, right. I, I find thinking about um, what are the challenges that may not be in, uh, what are the unintended consequences and thinking about the messaging and how that might, who are you unintentionally, unconsciously or consciously um, asking to do things and who are you unintentionally not asking to do things? So I think there's a bit of awareness that has to play into this. Um, um, an example would be um, uh, the, the tale, the traditional, like um, you want people to be able to warm introduction or talk to each other. Uh, but what if a lot of that talking happens in male dominated spaces? What if it happens at the bar? What if it happens in the men's restroom? Like, I don't understand that personally, why you talk to each other like that. But apparently <laughs> things like that happen. I've, I've heard. Um, well, the woman can't follow you into the bathroom and some women do not like to drink. And actually even men, some men are not huge drinkers or like, please don't make me have to go hiking to actually get to know you, you know? Um, 
and so just thinking about like what types of activities are we doing and and how are they actually probably excluding people in ways you may not think of and some of those might also be financial and uh, structurally based in um, and just to I would argue to get away from this idea that it's a personal assault on you like it's not about the goodness of your heart we I think everyone can be a great person and still participate in kind of structural racism or sexism or benevolent sexism mm -hmm. um, and I think those types of conversations are, are important to just think about moving forward and then the reality that um, that even, and I, I know I've been in the Ivy Leagues, right? I've been, I have had tons of access, but I can also tell you that um, the barriers, we still have a lot as many women in entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you think about the people of color, including women of color who get access to angel, angel investing or venture capitalists, like there are huge divides in that. And there are some structural reasons behind that. So I think thinking about that, the other question is what can I do here? And what I, what I think about Pittsburgh. So I've been thinking about entrepreneurship a lot and tech transfer. Amino um, therapy is this really fascinating space because it's so deeply connected with um, institutional research um, that there's a huge opportunity to do startup and entrepreneurship and all those types of ventures that I see happening in other spaces in the US. Biotech is also high risk, high reward. And so it's a bit different than a software company startup right. and the type of investment that it takes. Um, but nonetheless, I still think it's interesting to kind of in, in, to get scientists involved, to get MBAs or people who are interested in business and marketing involved, and also to get that leadership from experienced CEOs who have had companies before and kind of want to give back. Um, so one thing I think about is, is Pittsburgh. I knew it as a steel country. Um, I know, but what I've learned is that you guys are, we are re and we are re envisioning our space mm -hmm. and healthcare has become a huge sector here that has in some ways helped to um, compensate for the loss of uh, steel work, silk jobs. Uh, I also know tech is moving in and in particular automation. And so the question for me that I think is interesting is like, well, is there a space for Pittsburgh to become one of those immunotherapy research hubs? in tech hubs, the way you would see in Seattle, which has done a really great job of combining right. um, engineering and the hospitals there with these startup companies that have been allowed to have this really amazing ecosystem to have the jobs that you need there. So those are kind of the questions that I'm interested in, um, particularly because as a faculty, part of my job to do research, right? I have this small seat tech that if I don't get money, I will get fired. I will not have a business anymore. But I also want to produce scientists who are kind of civic minded and who also know how to take ownership of their science. And I've seen a lot of times where like scientists, like you need a job after this. What if that job were launching your ideas that you started here? How do you take advantage of those opportunities? Um, well, so I think I kind of hit on all three did, things we're interested in. You did a good job answering all three of them. You did a great yeah. job. I, I am sorry that we have to bring the show to a close, but I have learned a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount, the way that you have broken down, you know, the, the whole sort of basis of immunology and the fact that you are here in Pittsburgh and at Carnegie Mellon and very interested in entrepreneurship and breaking down barriers. I really appreciate your candor and uh, just your your dynamism in terms of you know, talking about the future. <laughs> so we are going to keep in touch. Yeah, okay? absolutely. This, we're gonna keep in touch. And if people wanna reach out to you, what's the best way for them to find you? Uh, um, email, I'm also uh, for social media people on uh, Twitter at Liz Wayne PhD. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we'll, fo we'll follow you. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. You can also email me um, at, C should I put it in the chat box or no? Okay, yeah. I'm just gonna write it in the chat box, but it- yeah, That would be great. Yeah, that's Twitter, yeah, so then my email. I mean, this is easily searchable, so. Okay. But E. Wayne, and then there's the PhD Biz podcast. Um, we also did the COVID episode. And I have to say, it's been really great to connect with people. So if I have questions about things, I just go ask someone if I can interview them. <laughs> That's great. That, that is great. So I, I want to thank Liftoff and the team at the Jewish Healthcare Foundation. Thank you, Megan. 
so much for your support. Really look forward to it. I am gonna keep track of Dr. Elizabeth Wayne and uh, because I think she's helping me understand some of the basics of physics in a way that perhaps <laughs> perhaps I haven't been able to articulate. You thought it'd be more fun, didn't you? It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And just thank you for being a leader and uh, you know, being pursuing your dreams. And that matters to each and every one of us. Absolutely. No matter no matter where we sit in our lives. So, uh, you know, a, a late welcome to Pittsburgh, but we're gonna stay connected to you. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. And Megan, next week, we're gonna do another liftoff on Wednesday. And we're very excited about the partnership and the work that they do. We think we've shared a lot of information today. And my hat's off to Dr. Elizabeth Wayne for doing the work that she's doing right here in our backyard. So I wanna thank everyone. Thanks for joining us. And again, thanks to the Jewish Healthcare Foundation as well as their program Liftoff. Take care, everyone. We'll see you here. Jonathan, who's here tomorrow? Well, tomorrow we have the Air Force has a very special project that talks about some flying cars. So we'll leave it at that. Oh, right. right. <laughs> okay, that might be cooler than what I just told you. Nah, almost as cool as you were talking about. <laughs> almost as cool, but. Uh, Liz, you can join in anytime. We do this every single day, and it's a great way for you to know what's happening in the region. It has been a delight. It has been a pure delight. Okay, thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. We will see you tomorrow, and uh, stay safe. Yes. Bye. Thank you.